the automotive industry has been in the news for a couple of reasons of late and those are one is the diesel debate and the second thing is the emission norms that have been uh, advanced the bs6 emission norms which have been advanced to 2020 but how is the automotive in, automotive industry going to grapple these problems of course in in such a case the suppliers play a key role and who better to talk about the suppliers role uh, than uh, someone from bosch and uh, we have with us dr marcus hain who is a management uh, board member in a speech you mentioned that uh, with your technologies it could be that the air emitted by a diesel engine can be cleaner than uh, the air that goes in, in, into the uh, inlet manifold, is that correct? Yes, uh, exactly. Um, and this is due to the fact that uh, the technology comprises um, a certain amount of filters um, mm. and it's proven by facts and figures mm. uh, that depending on the um, external air uh, pollution uh, the take-in uh, can be indeed more dirty than the, what's going out of the engine. Uh, and I think it's a good picture to work on because it contributes to our vision to really make uh, combustion engine-powered pa cars uh, as um, air-cleaning machines. That, that is what they are supposed to be. And we believe we can contribute technology-wise to that vision. That's correct. But at the same time, there's also a cost implication to it. Given that the emerging market like India is also price sensitive, are you working on a solution for that as well, to kind of contain costs? I think that's the challenge we are now um, having to master together with the OEMs. Uh, and it's not only about adopting technology which is out there, because Indian conditions are specific, climate is specific, driving cycles are specific, has to be very affordable, and the Indian market to me is so attractive because it combines attractive solutions with affordability and we need to come up with Indian specific solutions. So just copying from what we know of Europe is probably not the right thing to do but what we will bring to the table is our competencies, our knowledge, our experience uh, and we are open to work with the OEMs on Indian specific solutions which have been out there by the way all the time. If you look at the market today it is full of Indian specific solutions which you'll find nowhere else in the world. Like if you take a, an example which we can see uh, in the two-wheeler industry, for example, the single-channel ABS, mm -hmm. the low-cost version of the, the twin channel which is there in right. Europe. On the similar lines is what we can expect in terms of these uh, emission technologies as well? At least if we look at the powertrain as one full system, it would be not enough to look at it from a, a single component only side. So we have to look at one powertrain uh, as a whole in order to come up with a cost efficient solutions. Mm -hmm. If you just compare to the situation in Europe, it was always said going from Euro 4 to Euro 5 to Euro 6 will uh, increase cost significantly, making diesel totally unattractive. Mm -hmm. Now you see what has happened today, mm -hmm. the share has stayed the same and the vehicle price didn't go up. That's a similar challenge we need to take up in India, uh, of course, on other price levels. And also the, uh, the talking about emission norms, BS6, now that government announced that we have to meet BS6, the industry has to meet BS6 norms by 2020. Technically it's achievable, but the timeline is very short and it's not the automotive industry only that has to contribute uh, to make it that challenge, uh, to master that challenge successfully. Uh, we have to have uh, 10 ppm low sulfur fuel ready for doing at least two validation cycles AdBlue must be available nationwide. So I would say it's an orchestrated approach from both automotive industries, their suppliers, and the authorities and the mineral oil companies in order to make that challenge uh, happen. So two validation cycles would be how much in terms of period of time? Two validation cycles at least require one and a half years of timing uh, so that we can do both winter and summer testing um, over two periods. So you're saying by mid-2018 latest, you should this field should be available so that you can carry on those validations? I would rather like to see it beginning of 2018, to be very honest, because that fuel is uh, so important because we need to test the lubricity for the components in the engine. And we would not like to rely that discussion on imported uh, fuel. It should be Indian-made uh, low sulfur fuel that we can test uh, what it does to the components in the engine. Just for the benefit of our viewers, could you also tell us about what could be the overall 
say cost implications uh, in the market you know, uh, because how, how much ever you try to contain the cost obviously there will be some kind of cost uh, implication is a good question where to me today there is no one single answer what we need to do first is have the dialogue with the OEMs work on I would say a multitude of solutions which are specific to vehicle segments and specific models we will see all kinds of BS6 capable solutions and then I think we can give more precise answers on what is the cost delta and what is the performance uh, benefit we can have. Also there is, a, uh, I mean I've spoken to many uh, uh, in professionals who seem to believe that it could also be a virtually a kind of a death knell for smaller displacement diesel engines because of the again cost implications and other factors. Do you agree to that? Well, it would be for me too simple to just agree to that. Uh, it is like denying taking up the engineering challenge. Uh, of course, if you leave powertrain as it is today and you just add new technology to it, of course it makes it more mm. expensive. Mm. But as said, if we try to capture the system as a whole, uh, then for me it is not um, said that this is a given fact. We'll see uh, what the creativity brings and I'm very confident that in India the creativity levels are very high. <laughs> Especially with the renowned frugal engineering capabilities. That's right. Uh, talking about India, I just want to switch track to another technology, uh, autonomous driving, which is one of the mega uh, uh, trends on, in the industry. India as a market or as a base for developing solutions for applications elsewhere, how do you rate them, rate India? I would say um, automated driving is a revolution which comes step by step. So it's not that we can um, expect that tomorrow uh, you can drive hands-free through the middle of uh, Delhi city. That's totally unrealistic. So what we suggest is uh, focus on uh, areas, on specific use cases which can bring a concrete benefit. Just as an example, Commercial vehicles today uh, do have to do long-haul driving. Uh, imagine if the truck driver can be assisted by an automated function which keeps him on the specific lane as opposed to leaving that lane, uh, especially when he's getting more tired. Or uh, imagine if you're driving around in the city uh, and you want to park your car. Uh, these are the sort of use cases we think automated driving in the first step can really deliver a benefit and this is not totally out of reach uh, whereas fully autonomous driving that is um, maybe at 2025. And recently we added Japan as one of the test markets for autonomous mm -hmm. driving. So could India be next after Japan? Well, India could be next. Uh, we have already started the dialogue with the governments over here uh, and one of the important preconditions is that we can make use of our components which are needed uh, for making automated driving happening. And these are of course the ultrasonic sensors, these are also um, the long and mid-range radars and for that of course we need to have the release for specific frequencies in order to make that happen. But I think the dialogue is going uh, a positive route so I'm uh, confident that we can expect also t testings and trials in India. Dr. Hein, with you, it's always interesting to talk about new and futuristic technologies. So I won't miss this opportunity to ask you about the water injection technology, uh, <laughs> which as we have talked about it earlier as well. Right. Uh, just want to get an update on you know, where, where, where does that development, uh, what's the status of that uh, technology currently and when can we expect it? Okay, I'm not supposed to, let's say, um, to give any specific detail, but I can tell you that we have continued our development efforts on that technology and it is very likely that you see somewhere next year a vehicle which you can buy which has this technology already built in. And just to simplify, what would be the advantages of a vehicle with this technology as vis-a-vis -vis a vehicle without the te 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 technology and everything else being the same, same powertrain, mm -hmm. same engine? Well, there are various advantages. First of all, the water injection basically um, positively influences the combustion process. Uh, secondly, the water injection also contributes to lowering uh, emissions. Uh, and thirdly, um, by, let's say, reducing the entire temperature levels, 
uh, it is more likely that from a performance standpoint you can basically extend, extend the capabilities of the engine. So it's something which is obviously very attractive and uh, as said we are already having projects and one vehicle will be in the market soon. But I would assume that it will be more on the upper end, on the premium end. On the in that case your assumption I would say is true. On that note, thank you very much Dr. Heng, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.